Heroes in Prevention is a organization-wide effort to break the chains of infection, to go beyond hand-washing programs and flu shots, to create a whole new approach to minimizing infections. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, this is a special uh, session for me for a number of reasons. Um, one is I'm a, a very strong advocate for this need for a social revolution in residential care, but I also want to say that I am part of Christine's dissertation committee. And what's so exciting about this project is that not only is it a program that has been implemented and piloted in a number of places, but it is now going to be going through a relatively rigorous evaluation process. And for me, I'm, I'm uh, the uh, senior VP for research at Leading Age, which is the National Association of, of Nonprofit Aging Services Providers in the United States, and actually a few Canadian members as well. And um, I, I run their research group. And I'm a very strong believer of evidence-based practice. And the real beauty of this project is that it's a real-world program that evolved out of real-world needs. It's not something that a pointy-headed researcher actually thought up in a university. <laughs> and what is happening now is that Christine and her group is, is going to be able to put an evaluation framework around this program so that we can actually learn more about what's working and what isn't working. And for me, the, the most important thing for the providers in this group, whatever level you are at, is that when you're doing work, you want to be able to choose between just something that somebody said is great and something that really has a strong evidence base behind it. And a lot of times we think that because it's a social program with some, a lot of sort of touchy-feely pieces to it, that that can't be evaluated. And the truth of the matter is, is that it is, it is essential that we begin to evaluate all of our work so that, number one, we're not using resources in ways that we shouldn't because we all have very limited resources. And also because once you have an evidence base it really helps you to figure out how you implement and how you grow these programs. So for me, it's, a, it's an honor to be here as part of this team. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of intro, actually, uh, and then you'll move into the meat of the program. But as I said before, in the, over the next couple of years, we're going to be coming out with some really important findings that will not only help Christine and her group to strengthen the program, but also give a lot more credence to why all of our residential care environments ought to be doing this kind of a program. And the goal is to really make these things normative, right? Because, you know, the Pioneer Network in particular is typically a group of early adopters. So, like, you guys are great. But we have to think about the thousands and millions of elders and other folks who are living in residential care. And the goal for us is really to affect significant change, not with just with our believers, but with the others. And that's what this will do, is to move it from a program to a, an evidence-based program and then get it even more integrated into the daily life of the way that we practice. And hopefully, maybe even in the United States, we start to influence policy in terms of shifting how we invest in, particularly in care for people with dementia, uh, and, um, and also per perhaps think about our funding mechanisms and how we might be able to use our dollars in a different way. So, um, so with that, I just want to talk a little bit. First of all, the acknowledgments here you can see. Um, we've got folks here from uh, Schlegel. Um, and the funding coming out of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and uh, the University of British Columbia Public Scholars Initiative. Um, you know, I think it's wonderful for us. How many of us are, are from the U.S.? Any from, anybody from Canada? It's, it's just so wonderful to have 
a Canadian program that's being imported into the U.S. You know, it's a, it's a hard thing for us in the U.S. often to think that we can learn anything from others, which is kind of interesting, because when I go internationally, um, every other place is learning from everybody else. The U.S. is, you know, often very myopic in that area, and we've got a lot to learn from our neighbors to the north. So um, this is a really no other nice piece of this, that this is really an international activity uh, and a way of, of really sharing across borders. So the whole focus really around this is to talk about how do we address two really key and very significantly interrelated issues for many, many older adults, and particularly those living in residential care, and that really has to do with loneliness and depression. And just to give you a little bit of um, wh what we're talking about here, for, for those of us who want to use the same nomenclature, whether we're coming from the Canada side or the U.S. side, when we talk about residential care, we're talking about long-term care, assisted, and retirement living. So it really covers that, that spectrum. Um, in long-term care, one out, of, one out of two experience depression. This is, um, a number of years ago, I was on the Institute of Medicine committee that actually looked at the future of the geriatric workforce working in mental illness and mental health. And one of the sleeper issues in, in the US definitely is that we don't pay enough attention to depression. And we don't really acknowledge the effects of depression on the physical status, often the cognitive status, and all of the other things that come with that, and the fact that there's actually something that we can do about it. So this is a really key point in terms of understanding the magnitude of this um, oftentimes we're not assessing, so we don't even know the level and the magnitude of depression, but clearly it is a really serious issue, particularly when we're talking about residential care. Assisted living, higher depressive symptoms, 58% than the community, so there's something obviously, right? I mean, it's pretty intuitive that folks in some type of residential environment um, are going to experience more depression. Um, but for us, the question is, there are things that we can do about it. And um, one of the things that I love about this program is there's so much focus now on non-pharmacological interventions. And this is a strong non-pharmacological intervention that actually does so many different things. Um, I'm not sure about Canada, but in the U.S. we've had a heavy, heavy focus in the past few years on moving away from antipsychotics and pharmacological intervention. So in order to do that, nursing homes, residential care facilities, whatever we call it, they need to have options, right? Um, you can't just move away from meds without having interventions that work. So again, this is where a program like this begins to fit into your practice uh, and helps you actually even meet with the regulatory uh, environment that we are all in here, at, uh, in particularly in the United States. And then retirement, there's one out of five depression and 19% loneliness, and I would suggest that these are probably underestimated um, because you know when we start looking at this, it's really, really hard um, to even make sure that we're getting the responses that everybody will, you know, there's a lot of covering up of depression uh, in many situations. So um, just another example of the last refuge, um, a survey of residential institutions and homes for the aged in England and Wales. So this is not just a North American phenomenon. Um, actually, I would suggest that if you look internationally, you're gonna find loneliness and depression across the globe. Uh, and this is part of uh, the aging phenomenon tied to movement into residential care. And one of the things that I think, if we can create environments that are inviting and supportive, we can begin to change these percentages. And no longer does this become a pariah move. move. 
because for many folks, this is an important move from the community into some type of residential environment. It's essential. And it has had such a stigma. Uh, and some of that, I think, is tied to the fact that there is uh, issues around loneliness and depression. And somehow we have to, as providers, it is our responsibility to begin to deal with this. And this is really how this program moves us in that direction. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Christine, who's really going to introduce you to the program. And I hope you enjoy this, because it's not only exciting, but it's actually also fun. Yeah. So with that, I'll turn it over. Great. Thank you so much, Robin. Vera is an 82-year-old retired professor, recently moved into a long-term care home, and she has early stage dementia. She used to love volunteering in her community. She played the violin. And since her move into the home, however, she um, has found no interest in the activities that were provided. And she spent most of her time alone in her room listening to classical music on the radio. And I asked Vera, I said, how are you doing? And she said to me, this broke my heart, I think my room is at the end of the world. The environment in long-term care, residential care, is calling, I believe, for a social revolution. And by social revolution, I mean an overturning of the traditional activities process of providing light social events. And I'm talking about events like bus trips, strawberry socials, entertainment, this relentless focus on entertaining our elders as passive recipients of care to a model where residents are actively engaged in giving back, actively contributing to their communities. And um, I think that you know, these, these social gatherings are often planned and implemented by staff, have very little input traditionally by the residents themselves. So the, um, one of the things that we did is um, we created, we uh, wrote an article about this and we created a model, a different model of psychosocial care, which we called the REAP model. And REAP stands for a combination, so it's an acronym, and it stands for uh, resident engagement and peer support. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is this kind of like a, an overturning of a traditional system, a long-standing tradition, I must say. If you look at any activity calendar, you can Google them, look at any activity calendar, you'll see all these things on them. And um, But the REAP has three features which I wanted to talk about. And uh, number one is is exploring, coming at the, the whole social calendar, social programming, from um, exploring with residents um, what is meaningful to them. So really meaningful to them personally. And then the second part is exploring how residents can discover and um, uh, enhance their social identity within that community. And then the third one is for them to participate in these things that are meaningful to them um, in a way uh, with their community and giving back to that. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So I want to talk just very briefly about the social identity theory, which is what is underlies this whole model and this social revolution that I'm talking about. And that um, social identity is a concept that talks about um, how we see ourselves in relation to others by what we have in common. So that's kind of the concept of it. So for example, if you have a membership in a group, say you belong to a club, a reading group or a club, um, that um, you know, that gives you a meaningful identity within that group. And there's an abundance of research that is showing now that when we have a social identity, when we feel like we have an identity within our communities, that our well-being goes up. And not just a little bit, it goes up a lot. So, um, and research suggests that participation in a peer support group um, enhances our social identity in a lot of ways. So, um, and this in turn, of course, has an impact on loneliness and depression, which is what we're getting at. So peer support groups are everywhere in our communities. Who has peer support groups? What, what is that? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So are you talking about Pioneer? No, you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> Pioneer. Yeah, we have a. <laughs> we do. We have a. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Anyone else? Where do you see peer support groups? Someone had a hand up? Oh, okay. Yeah, so the Cancer Society has them? Somebody else have their hand up? Ah, okay, so peer, uh, sorry, uh, investigators, research investigators get together and support. Yeah, exactly, that's an example of it. Um, even a family can be a peer support group, but you know, the, we know that the Cancer Society uses them. There's Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, a Alcoholics Anonymous. They're all over the world, right? And um, Huntington's have support groups, Diabetic Society uses to support groups. So they're everywhere, but for some reason that model of peer support has not made its way into senior living. So it, it's very, very rare that you'll see a peer support group for residents in a long-term care home, in a nursing home, in an assisted living or retirement or independent living home. They're very, very rare. Yet we know they're um, abundant in the community. And the reason for that is when people participate in a peer support group on a regular basis, there's a significant decrease in loneliness and depression. That is why. So what we did is we went about taking a look at, so you know, if you think about what peer support is about, it's about giving. It's about giving to others, getting outside of our own internal worlds and focusing our intention and our attention on others. And so that's what we're asking people to do when they participate in a peer support group is that they listen to each other, give each other support. So, and, um, so it really is based on an, an abundance of research that shows us when you give more, you live more. People who, are, who give to others, who volunteer, are healthier and happier. So the Java Music Club is, um, started out with a pilot in 2003, and we took a look at what we could do differently, and we invited residents to actually help us develop this program. So they participated in a six-year pilot. It was over a long period of time where we looked at music. We thought at first, in the beginning, we just kind of all sat around a table, and I thought, oh, peer support group, it's so great, you know, and I thought, you know, have at it, and it didn't quite happen, you know. We, we found that it crumbled easily, that people were not comfortable just sitting around a table and talking, and so we started to add a little bit of structure to it, and we found that as we added more structure to it, it got stronger and better, people felt more confident, they felt a little safer, so we added music, photography, readings, quotes, um, and a talking stick. Um, would you mind holding that talking stick up so people can see? Um, because we thank you, Margaret. So, so there's a talking stick, um, and we found that it helped people who are quieter, people that didn't normally share when you held up a talking stick. Um, some people treated it like a microphone. They, they suddenly felt like they had something to say. You know, we have this one gentleman, every time he gets a talking stick, it's like he's addressing the United Nations. <laughs> and uh, he says, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. And then he shares. And then when he's finished sharing, he does it again. Thank you all for coming. And, you know, I mean, I laugh too, but I really want to tell you how moved I am by that because I realize it, it's a, a message to us that residents rarely have an opportunity to share what they really think about something and to have a group of people who are listening to them, paying attention to what they have to say. So. Uh, the reason we called it the Java Music Club is because we didn't want to call it a non-pharmacological, therapeutic, um, <laughs> peer support group. You can understand why. I mean, nobody would come to that. So we had to give it a fun name. The Java refers to coffee, and um, we added music because we know a lot of people like music. But the focus of the Java Music Club is on peer support residents helping residents. And not only helping the residents that are in their group, but they're focused on reaching out to other residents who are lonely and isolated in the community and bringing them into the group. So the group is structured for that. Um, so 
here's a photograph of, uh, this was just taken two weeks ago at a, a care home in Ontario. And this is a Java music club that's been going for two years. And I thought the photograph was just so amazing <laughs> because it just shows that social revolution right in the middle of it, you know. The, um, the energy and the enthusiasm they have for their club, their group together. They've been meeting regularly every week. So um, now with that, um, I want to tell you a story about the impact of these programs. Now I'm talking about a program called the Java Music Club, but I want to say, just for the record, you don't need the Java Music Club to do a peer support groups. Peer support groups are free. Anybody can do them anywhere at any time. You can go get a stick from the woods and you know take our idea and have a you know and have a group just like that. So I'm just talking about this particular program because um, it's what I'm the most familiar with, and I love to demonstrate how amazing it is when you combine peer support with music and photography. How it really enriches and enlivens the group, and particularly for people with dementia, it allows them to refocus and get reconnected over and over again throughout the group, because. What we found is that when we had nothing, when we had just us sitting around a bare table, we found it was difficult to keep the focus, that people kept drifting off, there was a lot of distractions. So that's why we put all those things together. The other question that I had was, how much of an impact can one peer support group a week have on a person's quality of life? Now, what we found is that many organizations, now we have over 600 organizations across Canada and the US using this program, and one of the things I've noticed is that they don't just have one Java Music Club going, many of them have eight, nine, and 10 going throughout the week, so they have the program in every neighborhood. If it's a bigger neighborhood or a bigger um, area in your home, you can have two or three Java Music Club going, so that as many people can attend the program um, as want to. And um, some adult day centers have the Java Music Club going every day. First thing in the morning, they have the Java Music Club. Some of them actually have it twice a day. They have one in the morning, one in the afternoon, because it really impacts people's um, energy throughout the day if they start the day off with having an emotional connection. So that's what we're talking about in peer support. It is more than having a cup of coffee and just hanging around the table. It is really about making an emotional connection with the people sitting at the table. And, and I'm not talking about psychotherapy. I'm not talking about going down to the depths of you know, all our problems. It's about empathy. And when people have empathy for one another, it changes everything. One of the, the new books that has just come out about senior bullying, I don't know if you saw that. Um, Oh, and I've forgotten the title of it. But the bullying that happens in organizations um, is really an issue, and it's kind of an emerging issue that we're starting to realize. And what we found is that when people engage in peer support, it's an antidote to bullying. So when people get to know each other, one, one of the things we found in our early research on the Java Music Club is the staff told us that they saw that residents started to get kinder to each other, not just in the Java Music Club, but throughout um, other programs in the home. And it was a real serious problem. They said that they saw residents who were downright mean and nasty to other residents get kinder. So it was an exciting kind of side effect that we had of implementing this peer support programming. So I want to tell you just a story about John, and then we're actually going to do a Java Music Club session so that you can see it in action for yourself. And, but I want to start with telling you about John, which is, um, to me is an example of how having peer support in your organization as a model of psychosocial care has an impact throughout the organization. So John, um, I've changed his name, but he was a resident in a care home. He had moved, he lived in British Columbia, lived in northern British Columbia, and um, he was an engineer. He had beautiful, warm brown eyes, and he had Huntington's. And he, they were not able to take care of him where he lived, so he was moved from his family, his whole community, down to southern British Columbia, moved into a care home where I worked. And he was socially isolated within two weeks. He was, he was not participating in anything. He was a really large man, and so when he walked down the hallway, he was in 
uh, already in the mid stages of the illness. And if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with Huntington's, but people t lose control of their muscles. And so he would walk down the hallway and his arms would be flailing out like this. And he could still walk, but he frightened people. So, you know, people would scatter when they saw him coming. He had to sit by himself in the dining room because he would knock dishes flying during meal times. And I saw what was going on. We had the Java Music Club going in this organization. So I went and knocked on John's door. I said, John, we're having the Java Music Club. I always say, I keep it really simple. I say, we're having music and coffee and we share. Come hang out with us. And he said, yes. And he came. And as he walked into the room, I saw Mary, who was a um, Java Music Club attendee for a while now. And she saw him and she looked at me and she went like this, you know. Like she crossed her arms, she went, don't bring him in here. I could see what she was saying to me loud and clear. Well, I completely ignored her and I said, John, this is the Java Music Club, Java Music Club, this is John. And he sat down and when the talking stick got passed to him, he started talking about how lonely he was, how he was struggling there, how he's missing his wife and his children that lived up in Northern British Columbia. And I'll never forget that moment because it was so profound. I mean, we had to haul out a Kleenex box. We all had kind of a group cry together, me included. And it changed everything. In one session, the relationship of that group changed with that individual. And you know what? It didn't require a pill. It didn't require therapy sessions. It was just that empathy that started to flow between the members. The next week, um, my office looked out over the dining room in that home. And the next week, I saw there was John sitting by himself. And his arm went out, whap like that. He knocked his coffee cup flying. And Mary was sitting way across the dining room. She gets up, hustles over to his table, mops up the coffee, goes and gets him another coffee and gives him a hug. It was so beautiful. And it wasn't just me who was watching that, but it was the whole dining room. They all saw that happen. And I believe it will have changed their relationship to him when they saw her do that. You know, she was tiny and he was like a really big man and she just wrapped her arms around and gave him a hug. So I think it's really talking about how peer support creates group empathy which has many multiple ramifications, emotional engagement between residents and this peer support. So how that one group can impact um, an entire organization. So when we, the Java Music Club then, when we finished, um, I did a process evaluation of the program as I was doing my master's work at Simon Fraser University. And when we finished with that, we packaged it up and it's now being distributed. Um, but then we had many requests from people that said, geez, I wish we had peer support programming for people with more advanced dementia. And we found that the Java Music Club was fantastic for people with early to mid-stage dementia. But then, unless the facilitators were really skilled at adapting, um, they had trouble using it with people with more advanced dementia. So we created a second program called Java Memory Care, and that is the Java Music Club adapted for people with advanced dementia. And I've had people say to me, Christine, surely you're not suggesting that people with advanced dementia can engage in peer support. And I'm here to tell you that yes, they can. And not only that, it's magnificent. So it's an adaptation. And so when the staff, when we put the right supports in place, when the staff have the training and know, for example, how to take a handshake from one resident and pass it on to another resident so that they turn and look at each other and greet each other. And if you do that correctly, it is so beautiful and so amazing to see. And as you're watching the Java Music Club here, you can see, imagine how we adapt things. We adapted questions so they're more concrete. And um, we found that um, it was really successful. So I don't want to talk too much about this, but just to say that, that it exists. And then, um, then a third program that we have created that is part of my PhD dissertation, um, of which um, Dr. Robin Stone is uh, on my committee is called Java Mentorship. And this program is about peer support again, but it is a little different in that uh, we form a team made up of residents, family, and volunteers. And they meet every week for a two hour program. The first hour of the program is a team meeting. So they talk about who's lonely in our community, who's isolated, who used to come to things, has stopped coming, um, who, um, 
you know, maybe somebody's just back from the hospital and they're struggling. Maybe um, somebody's husband just died. So those are the people, and that team identifies who those people are, and they do a check-in. They talk about how they're doing themselves and really build a team spirit, and they get some education. And um, so that they call themselves mentors, and the staff uh, usually is um, a recreation staff, but can also be a volunteer coordinator. We found that's really successful too. And they get education on how to sit with someone who's grieving, how to be a mentor, how to be with someone who has dementia, um, how to sit with someone who doesn't say anything, who rarely talks, how, what do you do when you go and visit them. And then they go out in the second hour and they do visits, but they don't go by themselves, they go in pairs. And we found that that doubles the success, uh, uh, the chances of a successful visit when you don't do the visiting one-on-one, -on -one, when you actually have two-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so they go off in pairs and go and visit those residents who are lonely, I say, and they bring them back into the community. And the idea is that they don't just bring them back to any program, but they bring them back to a peer support group because that's where they can really get connected. So they get invited as a special guest to the Java Music Club or to Java Memory Care. and. Um, so, um, so I want to just mention briefly about Vera, what happened with her. So as you remember, I was talking about Vera at the beginning, how um, she was a volunteer and um, loved classical music. And um, so what happened is that she got some visits from mentors in the mentorship program. They had these two women that came to see her regularly, they'd knock on their door, they'd hi, hi, and they would sit with her. And she went through this unbelievable transformation of being a resident who was socially, oh, hang on, I'm just going to fix this mic, I could hear it was quieter, is that better? Um, from somebody who was socially isolated, who did not participate in any activities, um, oh, hang on, to someone who said, um, I love it, they come to visit me, it's given me a new life. She not only started act attending activities, but she became a mentor herself. She joined the mentorship team and she started visiting other residents in the home who suffered from depression. And so she's like a shining example of peer support in action. So um, here we go. Um, so what I would like to do is actually walk through the program with you so you can observe it. So you might have to turn because we're going to sit at this middle table here. And um, what I'd like to do is invite some volunteers to jump in and join us. I promise I won't make you sing. Um, you can, <laughs> the nice thing about the Java Music Club is you can lip sync your way through the whole thing. Um, and you'll see people just sing along because it's so easy to participate in this. And, uh, would you? Yeah, it's so wonderful. So come grab a chair. We need one, two, three, four volunteers. And um, I want to introduce you to two um, special volunteers who came all the way from Ontario and have agreed to be part of our Java Music Club. They're two residents from the village of Arbor Trails, which is in Ontario, a retirement home. And they are Margaret and Ivan. Could you stand up? Yeah. So I want to thank them because I invited them to be a part of this, and uh, they, they just said, sure, what do we do, you know? <laughs> and uh, so they have not participated in a Java Music Club, though, before, so this is their first time, too. So we need one, two, three more volunteers. Anyone willing? Thank you. Come on up. Anyone else? Great. Come on. Yeah, come. Come, come, come. We can always grab another chair. So that's great. Perfect. All right. So um, what we normally do at the beginning of the Java Music Club is I invite, um, we use a manual, which I'm going to kind of hold up here so you can see this, and it has 52 themes in it that were chosen by that in initial pilot group that I talked about. And this pilot group uh, picked the music, the photography, the readings, and, um, and we assembled that over time. So at the beginning of the group, rather than me as facilitator picking the topic, um, they will pick the topic. So for today, um, and the other thing that I do is that we invite one of the residents to be our assistant. We used to call them leaders, and we found that residents often went, oh no, I, I don't want to lead this. You know, they didn't want anything to do with leading. But when we asked them to assist, it worked great. So, um, so I would invite someone like, can I, can I pick on you again, Margaret? <laughs> okay, so I, I would say to Margaret, Margaret, would you be able to help me to be my assistant today? And she would say yes, and I would give her the topics, and she could pick then the topic. So for today, can we pretend, Margaret, you're going to be our assistant, and um, 
she picked the topic just because we have it up on the screen um, of gratitude. Uh, whoops, hang on here, I'm gonna go back here. So there is a step-by-step um, -step guide. The exciting thing about the Java Music Club is it doesn't need to be staff who facilitate this program. It can be done by volunteers. It can be done by uh, family members. It can be done by residents themselves. So it's really exciting because it comes with a training DVD. It's only an hour long, so it's really easy to learn how to do this. And then there's a laminated step-by-step -step guide. Sorry, I've got my back to you, I know. Um, a step-by-step -step guide that you know you can get peanut butter, coffee, and jam on right away, which is really good. Um, that happens immediately. And, um, but it's really easy to follow. That was the intent of the program, is that it's not restricted to um, staff members to use it. So. Um, so we're going to pretend, and then the other thing that Margaret picked the topic of gratitude, and then um, I also show my assistant these wind chimes. I'm going to hold them up. Can you all see these? And um, these are a lovely, lovely instrument, and um, they're also called bar chimes. And what I do is then I say, as my assistant, could you also play the wind chimes when it comes time to play them? And rather than just assuming that she knows how to play these, because you'd be surprised, almost every person that I ask says, how do you play them? And I say, well, you just take the stick and you go down across like that. And people always say to me, then, can you play it the other way too? And I say, yes, you can. And I show them that. So I do a demonstration because when the group is going, I don't want to put them on the spot. So I do all of this before the group starts. So I would show, you know, I mean, right now it's a very, um, very public way of doing this. But then I would, so I would give Margaret the stick and then she would actually try the, the chimes herself so that when it comes time for me to do it in the group, she's done it. So go ahead. Yeah, nice and slow. You can go the other way. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, fine. you can hang on to that. Xylophone. What's that? It's a mini xylophone. It's like a xylophone. Yeah, so you can hang on to that. That's great. Okay. And the other thing I, I tell them about is the talking stick. So I explain that's what the talking stick is, that it's a way to honor and respect one another. And when you're holding the stick, you get the floor. So they understand that. So, um, as we go around the group, I invite you, would you mind using a microphone when we're sharing? And uh, that will really help so that people can hear. I don't know how to turn this thing on, but maybe it's just on now. Okay. So, uh, have I got everything? Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm gonna sit down here. So welcome to the Java Music Club. I'm so glad you all came. We would like to start with our opening song. And the residents will have the lyrics in front of them. And so if you go to the first song called the Java Music Club, and um, here comes the music. Yeah. You can lip sync. A little music keeps me feeling good. A little coffee like I knew I could. A great big hug and I'm okay I can make it through this day A little singing would be right on time A little loving and I'm feeling fine Sunshine through my window pane And I can make it through this day Here's the kind of people I like Ones that are kind Treat me right And that's why I think I love Our little Java Music Club Oh yeah Our little Java Music Club A little music Keeps me feeling good A little coffee Like I knew I could A great big hug And I'm okay I can make it through this day a little singing would be right on time A little loving and I'm feeling fine Sunshine through my window pane And I can make it through this day Here's the kind of people I like Ones that are kind and treat me right And that's why I think I love Our little Java music Oh yeah, our little Java Music Club. Hey, thank you very much.
Oh, a round of applause, that's great. So I invite all of you to participate in the group too. We'll just pretend we're one enormous Java music club. Um, so the next step in the program is to read what we call the group guidelines. So could I have a volunteer that would be willing to read? Yeah, okay. I'll pass you the microphone and the guidelines. And they're on the blue page in your books here. Number one, the primary purpose of this club is to share our experience, strength, and hope to support one another and to have fun. Number two, we use the traditional Aboriginal talking stick as a way to honor each person here and to remember us and to help us remember that all of us possess wisdom and courage. We do our best to listen closely with an open mind while others are sharing. Number three, we keep things we hear confidential and we respect each person's right to their opinion. We keep our sharing to a few minutes so that all who wish to have a chance to share. Number four, we have but one guiding principle and that is loving kindness. Well done, thank you. Thank you, okay. So the next thing that we do is called Getting Centered. And I'm going to invite my assistant, Margaret, to play the wind chimes before and after. And I invite all of you to participate in this. Getting centered is a way of helping us become present for the group. So Margaret, wind chimes, please. There's the mic, so everybody hears or not? No, uh, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's OK. Okay, so getting centered means putting all of our worries aside for a little while and becoming present. It helps us to have understanding and compassion for ourselves and for one another. People who are centered <clears throat> and present are happier. I now invite you to close your eyes for just a few moments. Close your eyes, take a deep breath in, and breathe out. Breathe in calm, breathe out worry, breathe in peace, breathe out fear, breathe in happiness, and relax. For those who wish to do so, please join me in saying, I am still alert and present. Together, I am still, still alert, alert and, present. and present. Thank you. You may open your eyes. And wind chimes, please, mark it. Beautiful. Thank you, Margaret. Well played, if I may say so. All right, so now we are on the middle part of the group. Let's see where I've, oh, I've forgotten to show the photographs. So here's our getting centered practice. So here's our topic of gratitude. So this is where we take the talking stick and pass it around the group. And what we'll do is one or two people will share, then we'll play a song. Another person will share, then perhaps we'll read one of the quotes. Another person will share, then maybe we'll show the photograph. So we'll kind of work our way around. So, um, Margaret, as my assistant, um, the first question is always, how's life? How are you? How are you doing? How do I? Would you repeat? How's life? How are you? It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm with friends who care about one another, who are looking at me, and as they do, I see their eyes and they smile. And the word smiles has one, the word mile between it. So you know that it's an empowering word. Thank you. Okay. So the topic today is gratitude. And the question is, can you name two things that you're grateful for? I am very grateful for my family, extended family, and family of friends. Okay. And is there someone in particular that you're close to in your family? Well, he happens to be sitting on my left. <laughs> and he's been there for me. and me for him for 64 years in August. Oh my goodness, wow. That's beautiful. 
great. Okay. And so tell us something wonderful about Ivan. He sounds like a pretty amazing guy. I, he is he's very supportive and he's very calm, where I tend to be very excited about whatever I'm doing and whatever I'm planning. So that's a very good combination in life. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. That's wonderful. So now you get to decide where the talking stick should go next. You can pick anyone in the group here, pass the talking stick on. I met you first. Okay. All right. So Fern. Hello, Fern. Hello. Yeah. So how are you, first of all? How's life? I'm feeling great. Life is wonderful. Yeah. No aches and pains? No nothing? Not today. No? Okay. <laughs> so um, can you name two things that you're thankful for? Uh, I'm thankful for my friends, my family, and my animal companions. And I'm also thankful that um, I have a job where I can share my talents and skills with the people I work with and the people I serve. Yeah, beautiful. And, and um, what is that? Um, um, a writer, marketing communications. Ah, beautiful, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so is there a particular, so you mentioned animals, I was just wondering, is there a particular? Yes, I have a Pomeranian um, who rules the house, and I also have a couple of cats. A couple of cats, wow, mm -hmm. dogs and cats in the same household. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's strange. Yeah, <laughs> anyone else like dogs and cats? You're not alone. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so we could go around in a circle and just keep talking, but I think it's nice to break it up. So we'll pretend, again, uh, because I have um, um, the music up here, that we picked the song. And so on the back of each photograph that we have, we have the songs listed that are related to that theme. So I would pass it over, say, to Amy. And say Amy is a really quiet resident who doesn't normally participate in things. So I would say, Amy, could you pick a song for us? Gives her a, a concrete task that she can accomplish easily with grace. Um, I pick Ain't We Got Fun. Ain't We Got OK. So would you mind picking What a Wonderful World? Oh. <laughs> or What just a Wonderful World. OK, good. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, she meant What a Wonderful World. Thank you. That's what I really meant. Yeah. So, um, well, I think so that um, so then we tell them where it is in the songbook. So we have the songbooks printed. They're nice and large, large font um, so that residents who have visual problems can see them. And um, that uh, isn't playing. I see that. OK, so we'll move on. So we'll just imagine that we just sang Wonderful World. On What's that? Yeah, it's up on the screen, too, yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, it's not playing right now. So um, right, so where's the talking stick? So you get to pick then. So we sung the song Wonderful World. Um, and where should the talking stick go next? Yeah. OK, we're to Hannah. So Hannah, how's life? It's pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Um, can you name two things that you're thankful for? Well, I am thankful to be here, and then I'm thankful for a long texting conversation with my autistic brother yesterday. A long texting? Yeah, conversa conversation. He's texting me, which he normally doesn't do. Oh, okay, with your brother. Yeah, he has Asperger's. He has Asperger's. Okay, and is that an unusual thing? He was actually texting me and my mom at the same time so that he doesn't multitask, and so yeah. it was really cool he was cutting out some time for me. Really? Great. And are you close to your brother? Very close. Very close. What's his name? Michael. Michael. And tell us something amazing about Michael. Well, he is super excited about me being here. He, he doesn't like to hug people, and he gave me a huge hug before I walked out for the airport. Uh, yeah. Which did have me crying. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, he sounds like an amazing guy. Are you the same age, more or less? He's two or? years older. He, he's two years older? Yes. Yeah. So he's your older brother. Yes, he's my yeah. older brother. Mm. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. So now, um, just in the interest of time, um, I'll move on to the quotes and readings. So on the back of each topic in the binder, there's quotes and readings related to the topic. And could I ask you, Ivan, to choose one of the quotes? So I'm going to pass this over to Ivan. And would you mind passing him the microphone, too? And Ivan, could you go? There's three, three quotes there. Could you pick one of them that calls to you that you would like to read out for us? We grow, to love, we grow in love when we grow in gratefulness. And we grow in gratefulness when we grow in love. Every time we say a simple thank you and mean it, 
we practice the inner gesture of yes. And the more we practice, the easier it becomes. Yeah. So what do you think of that? That's a wonderful uh, quote. And uh, it's, it's so true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That uh, when you uh, say something like a simple thank you, people respond to it. And uh, you've, gained a, you've gained a new friend. A new friend. And uh, interesting, here since I've been to the conference, I have learned that a hug goes a long way to meet a new friend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it does, yeah. And of course, I sort of enjoy it with the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. OK. Now, um, then we'll imagine, just for interest of time, another person has shared. And then, um, and then we'll show a photograph. So I'll go back to our photograph. And what we do with that is um, we pass it around the group, and everyone gets a chance to share. And the question that we ask with the photographs is very simple. It's just, what do you see going on in this picture? The answer is a rich reservoir of information about the person who is talking about the picture. So, and the answer is always correct. So it's a wonderful way to succeed. Um, oh, thank you. When I look at this picture, I see joy. She just looks so joyful and free. She's got her arms open. She's open to the world, open to the sky. She's, you know, looking at something beautiful. So that's what I see, a lot of joyfulness. A joyfulness, okay. So what's going on in that picture? I see um, worship. Worship. Um, I see praise and just awesomeness at what life has to offer. Ah, okay. Awesomeness at what life has to offer. What do you see? Why is a woman standing up there with her arms out like this? What I see is what I would probably be doing. Um, it looks to me like she just got done with an early morning run, and she is so thankful it is now over. <laughs> That's what I see, because it's very pretty, and it would be a beautiful time of day to appreciate and go for, an extra, go for a run. Yeah. But it's always so nice when it's over. Yeah. Good, thank you. I see um, a woman with her arms wide open taking a very deep breath and inhaling all this pure, clean air around her and the light and the quiet sounds um, and just receiving it all and taking it all in and expressing gratitude. I see someone soaking in life. Soaking in life. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. I see somebody um, dancing, uh, a dance of gratitude. And I think it's sunset rather than sunrise. Ah, Just thankful sunset. for a lovely day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see definitely the connection that she has with the world, which begins with people, persons, I should say, and then the whole community. And with community is connectedness. Hang on, I'm just going to unplug here. <laughs> unplug me. Okay, go ahead. I see this, perky, uh, this person looking out over a landscape and saying, thank God I live in a country where the two greatest countries in the world neighbor each other. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I see too. Uh, I, I, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, this is a young mother who uh, has just uh, taken a little break for herself and run up to the top of a mountain for a rest. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it's so interesting about a photograph, you can see anything. And I, I remember one woman looking at this picture and saying, thank God he's gone. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. And um, so just in the interest of time, we'll pretend the talking stick has made its way around the group, and we've come now to what's called our closing affirmation. So that is on the green page at the end of your songbook, Sarah. And this is something that we'll read together. <coughs> and I'll just make sure I've got it up here so that you can all see it too. So please read this with me. And um, I would like to invite Margaret, my assistant, to play the wind chimes again. Beautiful. Together, I love, accept, and appreciate all of me just as I am today. 
I bring understanding and compassion, and I receive understanding and compassion. I bring love, and I receive love. I bring peace, and I am at peace. Wind chimes, please. Thank you. And we'll finish with our closing song called I'll Be There For You. May you have time to rest And may your fortune be the best Meet some kindness on your way and have sunshine most every day May you always do your part And have a song in your heart And may every day be blessed For I wish you all the best Enjoy Thank you so much. Give this wonderful group of volunteers a round of applause. Thank you so much for participating. And, um, pardon me? Oh, oh, that was the next room. I thought I heard a voice. I'm hearing voices. So, um, so what I'd like to do is pass the microphone back to Margaret. And, uh, sorry, back to Robin. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we just saw. And one of the things that I wanted to say about the, the evidence base that we're working on right now is that, uh, hang on, I'm just hooked up here, is that um, we have a number of studies that are already underway of this program um, and of the Java Memory Care program with the University of Alaska is in the middle of two studies, actually, that they're working on. We've got the Alzheimer's Resource Center in Connecticut is um, halfway through a study. And we also have the University of Carleton in Ottawa is launching a study in the fall. So there's lots of um, outcomes-based research that is underway, and we'll have those results for you as we go along. The Java Mentorship Program, again, is my dissertation. So that um, we just collected the final data on that. We presented that yesterday, the early results, and more to come on that. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Robin and she's going to guide us through a reflection. Sure. So um, let's start by just getting some observations about what stood out for you about the program. Anybody have any thoughts about this, either folks who participated in the program or those of us who are sitting sort of silently participating or watching? Yes, Margaret. Okay. Did it, did everybody hear that? Okay. I think the. Trade you. How's that? Yeah. I, I think the, um, the 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 focus on person and and purpose um, is really important. Um, 
Anybody else? I mean, I have some observations, but I would love to get some other input. Yes. It's very important because it definitely shows that people are feeling very good about the place and the persons and the purpose with whom they're interacting. Um, I have a, a question. Uh, it would assume to me that the larger the group, the less effective this might be. I'm wondering if you've come to a conclusion as to the, um, the best size for the group. Yeah, we found that um, this kind of a size, about eight or so residents, is at an ideal size. If they have more advanced dementia, then I would recommend making the groups a bit smaller. So just four residents, maybe three or four, works better for people with more advanced dementia. But we've had the Java Music Club where it's 10 or 12. If you get bigger than that, then it gets less. So we found that, that having that size is ideal. Orange. How do you um, get any kind of cross communication with your participants so they do get to know each other other than the guided conversation? Yeah, so the way the sharing, so each week is a different topic. So this week we talked about gratitude. Next week it might be about happiness, which can be a happy or a sad topic. Um, and they pick the topic, so they're already communicating what um, they want to talk about. But they get to know each other through the conversation. And what we found is that although it's structured with a talking stick, gets passed from person to person, there's lots of conversation that goes on in between them along the way. So it's not rigid that way. But the talking stick is really effective because it helps um, the people who I, I like to call storytellers, the ones who are yak, 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 and they cannot stop talking. It helps them be quieter. And the people that are quieter tend to talk more because of the talking stick. So it has a really great kind of leveling effect on that. Thank you. It's a great question. We've just been, well, hearing this week, loneliness, helplessness, boredom. That's our job to eliminate that. And I just think this is a fantastic way to, to do that, right, in our homes. My question is um, the variety of people um, that who, who lead something like this within a home. Um, because like the whole silo thing, if you just assign it to life enrichment or programs, right? So do you have, you know... A variety of people. Would your director of care lead one? Would your administrator lead one? Would your life enrichment person lead one? Would a you know um, a care partner? Like I know anybody could. I know volunteers could. But have you seen it used that there are you know multiple people? I would love to I do education and quality improvement, but I would love to lead one. You know. Thank you. That's a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, some of the organizations do uh, cross-disciplinary training, and so they have chaplains leading it. They have um, CNAs leading it, uh, social workers, family members, volunteers. I talked about that already. One organization, I can't remember if I said this already, but one organization in Ontario, um, the whole movement of peer support throughout their organization was spearheaded by the volunteer coordinator. And she has trained in a year and a half, has trained over 40 volunteers, and they're, they're from all walks of life to lead the program. So it's, it's not um, staff, it, in fact, no staff lead the program. It's all led by volunteers. But um, it's interesting because the Schlegel Villages trains their horticultural therapists to lead the program. They train their, they do Java Music Club with their managers, and so they, so everyone and anyone can lead the program. Great question. Do one you of have the to go through is, oh, oh, sorry. One of the things I want to do, because I, I, I want to put up all four of these questions that are related to the observations, because I think we're touching on all of them. So um, as we're thinking about this, think about the difference about this kind of a peer support program, what you might be seeing in some, some of the going on at the same time. Is that? Oh, OK. Anyway, thinking about this relative to a lot of the traditional programs that we have in a lot of our organizations, um, what about this in terms of a, a, um, a foundation for a social revolution within 
our organizations, and then some of the barriers and benefits. Um, and, and I actually have got some of my own thoughts about that. So, um, but let's go on to folks who had their hands raised. It seemed like there was a hand or somebody starting to talk. Yeah, I was just curious, um, when you say that you have trained volunteers or trained other, is there a specific training process or is it just a matter of getting the system and reading through to learn how to do it yourself or is there a training program? There is, there is a training program. Um, there's a training DVD that comes with the Java Music Club. There's lots of information also on you know, the internet about peer support programs and how to lead them. So you don't, like I say again, you don't need to have the Java Music Club, but we've created a, a specific training. There's a step guide that they follow, but there's also a video that goes with it so they can learn how to do it. And what we found, the video's only an hour long, so the uptake of it is fast, so you can watch uh, have your you know, staff or volunteers gather around the video and then if they sit in on the Java Music Club that we just did now, they'll learn really quickly on how to facilitate it. I must uh, admit that perhaps I was a little nervous here when uh, Christine asked us to, uh, to, to uh, participate because I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. but. Uh, uh, you almost immediately get a sense of belonging to a group and uh, you reach a comfort zone. And I found it extremely interesting when Christine passed this diagram around. There were eight of us seated at this table and eight of us had completely different visions of, of gratitude. Um, also, I would think the success of the group is going to de largely depend though on a very talented leader and someone with some special skills. I think that's clearly, um, I think that's why one of the things that f folks often underestimate, again, going back to my research and sort of organization hat, is that these kinds of programs can be easily done and that you don't need structure. And I, I think one of my observations was how important the structure was. And you know, this is one of my observations from being at a leading age, which is a big national association, so I get to see a lot of different kinds of programs, is that often people just sort of pull programs out of their ear. And um, that's probably fine, but I think you can see the difference between programs that actually have a lot of work and piloting and structure behind it. And um, similar to what people often think about using volunteers, oh, well, that's just easy. You know, we just get a bunch of volunteers. We all know how hard volunteer programs are. I think peer support programs are really difficult. And, you know, whether it's the, this particular structure or another structure, um, my observation is, is that there needs to be structure, and it isn't as easy as just Googling and going online and doing something. So I, I agree with you. I think the leader, the leader is really important, but also the structure is really important. And, and one of the questions that I had, because it, it, it seems to me that this is a very white, at least middle class group that we have sitting here, and I was thinking about the application of this for one thing, for people with different levels of literacy, um, and particularly with the current cohorts of elderly in many of our organizations where there's a lot of variation in terms of even people being able to read. Um, the other, of course, is as you move more into more advanced dementia, how you actually are able to deal with that. And, and then the final thing that I thought about was what are, is there cult, are there some cultural competence questions or issues around how this might be adapted or used in organizations where there are very, very different kinds of people, whether it's racial or ethnic differences, um, other kinds of cultural differences. How do you, obviously this is a, a pretty generic structure, I think, but it obviously would need a lot of adaptation. So I'll stop there. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I don't know if I'll remember all the questions, but um, I'll, I'll talk about, because these questions have come up before and they're excellent questions. One of the things that we found is that 
um, the empathy, the feeling of belonging to a group, so a social context of a group, that is so powerful and so strong that people who do not speak the language have sat in on Java music clubs and love it and keep coming back to it, getting drawn into it, including those with advanced cognitive impairment. They get drawn to that energy of sitting in a social circle, people smiling at each other, um, caring about each other. That is a very powerful emotional energy that goes on. Um, it, so when it comes to uh, time for you know us to look at different cultures, we um, we found that um, what we did is we first of all we translated into French, being Canadian. So we had an organization uh, called Chartwell who wanted to roll this out across Canada, um, but they needed it in French for Quebec. So we had the program translated into French, and then we hired a. a, a French music therapist to find us songs because I don't speak French and uh, so we adapted the whole thing and so now we have 48 homes in Quebec who are successfully running this program so it's been adapted into that culture. The second one that we did was we translated the program into Cantonese because in British Columbia where I'm from we have a very strong uh, Chinese culture there and uh, so we had a team of translators from the university at um, change it into Cantonese for us. <laughs> Again, I don't speak a word of Cantonese, so it was a real challenge. It took us about a year to do it. And so now we've been trialing that in the Chinese culture. It's fascinating how much, um, how people want to get drawn together into groups and want to be there for each other. So there's a lot of work to be done, though, I understand, and I, I really appreciate the questions, and the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I don't know all of that yet. We've got a lot of work still to do on that. Um, what was the other questions? Dementia. Oh, yeah. As, as you move into more advanced dementia, how do you yeah. sort of adapt this kind of a... Obviously, it may be that the circle itself, yeah. um, which, again, is structured and is inviting, which I think is so interesting that it really mitigated your nervousness pretty quickly. I mean, maybe yeah. that's enough to sort of make this happen. I was just curious as to yeah. how that might be adapted to people with more significant cognitive impairment. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. One of the things that people ask me, too, is about how can this possibly work with people with advanced dementia. And what we found is that when you adjust the question, so instead of asking, can you name two things you're thankful for, we change those questions into more concrete questions, so the people that were still verbal are able to answer, are you thankful for your husband, Ivan? And then she could answer yes or no. And so we changed all the questions. Um, this is the Java Memory Care Program. When we added things into it like, um, we added passing a handshake from um, resident to resident in the group. The groups are smaller, not this large. And so I would, I would um, shake Ivan's hand and I would say, thank you for coming to our group. Could you help me welcome Margaret to our group? And then if he is ab not able to, I'd, I would actually take his hand and pass it over to Margaret and then allow the two of them to make a connection with mm -hmm. each other. So it's always about resident peer support, residents helping each other, not what I can do to them and for them, but what they can do for one another. Mm -hmm. so, so all of the components of the Java Music Club were adapted in that way so that, um, and so we've been trialing the program now. We have a number of organizations who are using Java Memory Care with advanced dementia, and it's really about emotional engagement between residents. And when you focus on when people's cognitive abilities go down, their emotional sensitivity goes way up, and so when you focus on that, when the questions are about emotional topics, then um, they are able to engage them. I've been um, surprised over and over again how much I have underestimated what people are capable of and um, how much they are able to understand um, love, how much they're able to understand caring gestures. So when, I, when we're talking about the topic of hugging, for example, um, we train the staff um, rather than just say the word hug that they actually demonstrate it to. So they would you know, do this kind of emotion to show what hugging is and uh, so that people are able to understand. So there's much more information on the website. If you go to Java GP, you can um, hear. Um, there's actually a video where we show the Java Memory Care program in action so you can see some of the things I'm trying to explain to you, which is difficult to put into words. This may not be totally connected with what you're doing, but my heart goes up, out for our aboriginals. And you mentioned about taking it to the French, mm -hmm. and they're dear to our hearts too. They're part of our cultural mosaic. You probably don't have the answer now, but could you think about how this could relate to the aboriginal communities? 
Definitely, can. yes, for sure. And the talking stick was actually, it's so interesting. We borrowed that from their culture. And the first um, groups that we did and the first talking sticks is talking sticks are made by two elders living in British Columbia on Vancouver Island. They actually are two senior men who go out into the woods and cut the, <laughs> cut the sticks for us. They um, shave them down. They put the, um, the finish on them. And... Um, but when we first started making them, I, I thought I wanted to know more about the culture and, and can we use these sticks with their blessing. And so we actually went to the Aboriginal community and we had some elders come sit with us and explain to us how we can use the talking stick. And they actually blessed our first talking sticks. We did a smudging ceremony and they actually right. blessed our first talking sticks before they went out so that... Um, they made sure that we were doing this in a culturally appropriate way. So to answer your question, yes, we actually have some communities now that are starting to use it, and it's very early days yet, but um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. You know, Christine, it, it, it occurred to me um, at, we are at we are getting uh, feedback at, at leading age that many of our organizations are starting to experience some significant workforce crisis, crises. We're seeing a lot more turnover and um, difficulty in both recruiting and retaining, which is always a problem, but it's gotten worse, at least in the US now, because our economy is better. And these kinds of, this peer support circle seems as though it would work really well with, with staff. And I, I don't know whether you've used it with staff, but it seems to me not, particularly if you wanted to do some cross-staff work where you had CNAs, um, frontline managers, maybe mid-level managers, and even uh, C-suite people who are often totally not in touch, quite honestly, with what the heck is really going on in organizations. So, you know, I don't know whether you've used it for that at all, but it does seem like that would really work in terms of just really helping staff to connect with each other, so. Yeah, thank you. I've thought about that often, in fact, and um, wished that that was something when I were, I worked for over 20 years in long-term care, and I wished that I had a group like that where we could sit and talk about what's really going on um, in a safe environment yeah, to do that. So we, have, we haven't yet, but it's on my mind, it's on my agenda, actually, as soon as I finish my PhD. And, but um, I wanted to say that we have used it with resident councils, and they, uh, the Ontario Association for Resident Councils has actually adopted the talking stick model and use it in their resident council meetings. So that's a really great way to you know, help people in a meeting honor and respect each other. And I know that the managers at Schlegel Villages use them too. So, um, that, but thank you for bringing that up. That's an excellent point and something that, um, like I say, we still have more work to do. Any other questions? Well, I, I think it's great, um, like bringing CNAs in and everything to facilitate because it gives them a sense of purpose, whoever, whoever it is, or maintenance or, or anybody, the chaplain, anybody. But I also think, like I attended your mentorship yesterday, I think that would also be a good thing to bring staff in as a volunteer to do your one-on-ones you know, to have a person of staff and then um, the second person visiting the visitee. I think that would engage them and affirm them. Yeah, I agree. Thank you very much. Thinking of your question about a social revolution, I'm, I'm, you know, we really need to move from diversion to engagement, which I think is what you're really talking about. Um, have there have you have you looked at or thought about pulling staff out as facilitators and maybe having staff, uh, residents who are more cognitively able to be the facilitator for some of the other groups so it really does become total peer support? Have you looked at that or I, I think if we could get to that point I and our residents are running our activities, I think would be the revolution we're looking for. 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you're right. The revolution can happen on so many different levels. We have um, residents who are facilitating this program. We have some in affordable housing in the U.S. here. Um, residents themselves have just taken the program on and are facilitating it, which is so exciting. And also in Ontario, we have a resident, for example, who lives in a long-term care home. She's in a wheelchair, and she takes the Java Music Club materials, which are on a cart, because you can see there's a lot of stuff that they carry around, the songbooks, the CD player, the, and she wheels herself into the memory care neighborhood and facilitates Java Music Club in the memory care neighborhood. So that's just to give us an indication of what is possible with this. Um, and the more that we can hand over the leadership of this program into the hands of the people who are using it, the better. So thank you. Excellent question. Christine, I was wondering, uh, what type of program do you have for training the leaders of this? Because I believe that when you gather a group together for the first time, that it's essential that this is successful. I think if it's a failure, it may be difficult to reinstitute it again. Yeah, like I said, we have a, a training DVD. There's also, um, we put together a facilitator training manual that helps um, the facilitators learn about different aspects of it. We also provide um, day workshops, so you can actually hire me to come and I'll spend a whole day with your staff. And that's what we did with Chartwell, for example, in Canada, is I came and we did a, a training in Western Canada, all the facilitators came, then we went to Eastern Canada and did it again there. So there's different ways you can do it. The, the best way, though, for people to learn how to do it is to do it. And um, so once they have some initial kind of con to understand what the concept of it is, it's not about me fixing all the problems that are in the group. It's just about people having to share what is going on for them in a real way. Because then they find out, this is the, the secret of peer support, I think, is that they find out I'm no longer alone. Whatever the problem is, and often the problems are not fixable anyway, when people are talking about grieving, they've lost their spouse or whatever, we can't fix those problems, but they find out that they're not alone because somebody else will reach out to them and say, uh, I'm here for you. So I, the training is important, I agree, and, but we found out that um, they, although they follow a guide, and I, I really invite them to follow the guide exactly as it's written because then the, the group, the residents find out really quickly what the structure is of the peer support program. For example, I had a resident with dementia who was in, in our early pilot groups, and I came to the group one day to facilitate it, and I forgot the talking stick in my office. And, um, and I thought, oh, well, we'll just do it without, because my office was a long ways away. And um, she looked at me and she said, where's the banana? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I knew right away what she meant, and I said, I forgot the banana. And she said, we can't do this without the banana. <laughs> and I said, you're right, hang on, I'll be right back. And I ran all the way down, got the banana, came back, That's and then hysterical. we had the group. So, and I think the ritual of the program is really important, and you really can't screw this up. Do you know what I mean? Like if you, even if you forget, say you forget the guidelines one week, or you forget something the next week, but the structure of it, the ritual of it, creates a sense of safety. And I found that even in their very first group, when people who participate in, they're really willing to, because they can see right away from the guidelines, kind of the way it's set up, that people are able to talk about what's really going on here, inside, at this group. This is where you can share what's going on. It's not, you don't have to talk about the weather and our clothing here. Here you can talk about what's going on. So. So we're, we're actually at 1130. Um, we're done. You know, I, so, I mean, we could probably go on for hours one last question, okay. What did the Chinese adapt as a, walking, as a talking stick? What did the Chinese adapt? For what did they use as a talking stick? The same thing. Yeah, they, we found it really didn't seem to matter what culture, whether they were Italian, Chinese, or Portuguese. They, the talking stick was the talking stick, and it seemed to transcend the culture. But thank you. But in Louisiana, we're going to use a Piro or, or something like that rather yeah. than... Sure, yeah, you could use anything. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. You could adapt it to the culture. So yeah. the talking stick is just an example. You could use a feather, but we found a feather got dirty really quickly. <laughs> we tried a feather, and we tried a stone, too, but the stone was too small or something. Yeah, it just kind of sat there, so we decided a stick How had more. How about a banana? That would be a good yeah, idea. <laughs> you could use a banana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, and, yeah, come see us if you have questions. Thank you.